The 2012 Clock Snare. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. Today we are going to be looking at several ideas that we are going to speculate about. And keep this in mind as we are going to be talking about a lot of material today. Speculation, we're going to be talking about things that we don't know exactly for sure. We don't know the granular details of them. We look in scripture what it says about prophetic events that are about to unfold. But there are the granular details that we don't know the specifics of. So this is what we're going to look at today. In the broader context of what we do know scripture does tell us, we're going to use those as our anchors and our keys to guide our understanding. But we're going to speculate about some of the more granular details that we suspect and that the Lord appears to be giving us wisdom about how things will unfold very soon on the prophetic calendar, especially as we see the day approaching. So always keep in mind what we're covering today is speculation. We're just putting our notes out on the table. We're talking about them. That's all that we're doing today. We already know so much about what Scripture says about this time, but we are digging deeper as we watch and we see the day approaching. If you have not yet, and even if you have, I highly recommend that you watch our videos, The White Horse Rider and Time Countdown. We're going to be further talking about the role of changing time in prophecy once the Antichrist is given the power to change time. We're going to be talking about that today, so if you are new to this channel, or even if you haven't watched those videos in a while, I highly suggest that you do because there is a lot that should be refreshed before you dive into this subject. We're going to assume that you have watched that. Also, I highly recommend our short PDF, Time of Perplexity, which condenses a lot of the information. It's very concise. And then there's also our time posters that are available at rapturelibrary.com. Com that goes much more in depth on these subjects. How scripture talks about time will be changed. The Antichrist will be changing time. Christ will be changing and shortening time. There's going to be some incredible perplexing events once the tribulation starts. So definitely check out these resources. You can find links in the description box. Again, if you have not watched our previous videos on time or our playlist on time, you really need to watch that before you watch this video. We're at a very interesting time when we go outside and look up and lift up our heads. We can look on the celestial clock, just as Jesus Christ encouraged and really commanded us to do. When we look up and lift up our heads, we can see the time. And we are at an important celestial and agricultural time because we are right now at the peak of summer. We are at the peak of the dog days of summer. And when we consider that in the prophetic context of the fig tree and all the trees putting forth, that was a signal, a sign that summer was drawing nigh. And in a parallel, likewise, those signs foretold also that our Redeemer would be coming at a certain time after certain signs were seen. One shows that the other is arriving. And now we're at the time of summer, which was pictured in the pattern of what was arriving in those parallels. So there's a lot of great expectation where we are right now, particularly with the peace and safety calls also bringing our attention back to this same time. And so when we look on the celestial clock in the morning, shortly before the sun rises, we can see over in the southwest, Jupiter is a morning star. It's a very bright morning star. You also see Sirius, which is a fixed star. It is also now rising as a morning star as well. Both of these are seen in the morning, so they are both morning stars. Jupiter is the king planet, while the names of Sirius has the ideas of coming quickly. So we see a combination, a double emphasis of these themes, the king coming quickly. And these very same themes are also emphasized in the book of Revelation too, even the last chapter. So there's a lot that tells us we should be looking up and looking at the pictures and parallels that we are told to look for and that we should expect to see. So here at this arrival time of the peak of summer, the dog days of summer, we are at the peak of summer, the peak of this arrival time. And of course, the dog days of summer still goes for about 20 more days. We do not know the day or hour, but we do know when we are told to look and expect our Redeemer to come. And we are right here at this arrival expectation time. We also know, and we've talked about in our time videos, that our very same Redeemer warned us very sternly that when he does come, there is going to be a snare that is going to be following right after that. There is going to be a snare that traps the whole world. And he especially warned us that we should be watching, we should be sober, we should be watching ourselves, taking heed to ourselves. How are we living? Not caught like Lot's wife, distracted and turning away and not listening really to our Lord's instructions. How will we be found when our Lord comes? A snare is a loop that traps your feet. It grabs your feet. And once it grabs your feet, you aren't going anywhere. And that's what he's warning the disciples and he's warning us. There is a snare that is coming. And once it comes, those who are here, those who are also left behind with those who are here, they all will be stuck here. They are not going anywhere. Their feet are stuck. 
and it's coming on the face of the whole earth, the entire earth. There is going to be a physical trapping that is going to affect the whole earth and all those who are still here. And so this is what I've been thinking of a lot lately and pondering and asking the Lord for wisdom, searching more into scripture and just reflecting and meditating on all that we have covered, looking at our posters, even watching our own videos on it again. And just the Lord's really given wisdom over the past few days how all this comes together. Because we've often thought, what is the timing of all this? We know a snare is coming. And we've even talked about before how it definitely looks from a plain reading in Scripture that it's going to be sprung immediately, right away, right after the rapture. And the more that I've been studying it, the more I've been looking at it, the Lord's really emphasized that, yes, the snare is going to be sprung immediately, immediately trapping everyone immediately. All those events with the snare will be going into effect right away. And the Lord definitely reminded me of Revelation chapter 6, which details when the seven seals are opened. What is the very first seal that is opened? It is the rider on the white horse. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Jesus Christ warned that a snare is coming. It's going to be sprung. Sudden destruction is coming. The Apostle Paul also warned about that. And in Revelation chapter 6, we see the very first event, the very first things that are coming upon the face of the earth that Jesus Christ warned about. The very first thing is a rider on a white horse showing up and he already has a bow in his hand. And so this further emphasizes the suddenness, the immediacy right after the rapture. The very first event is this guy coming onto the scene with his bow, with his weapon. It is the very first event, the very first thing that is coming. And we've talked about in our videos, White Horse Rider. The rider is not Jesus Christ. He is the Antichrist. He is very specifically described differently than Jesus Christ is. He is definitely the Antichrist. And he has a bow like you use for arrows. And a lot of people get way off base, way off the reservation, because they say, oh, there's no arrows there. And so they start making all sorts of crazy nonsense and speculation and all these assumptions that have no basis in reality. Because when you look in the Old Testament, this is normally how it's referred to. You don't refer to, oh, he had a bow and arrows. You say he had a bow. He's coming with the strength of his bow. At least 27 times in the Bible, this is how they are normally referred to. You just refer to the bow. This is how someone with bows and arrows is normally described. You just cut straight to the chase. They have a bow. That is the main weapon. He's talking literally about a bow, how it's normally described in scripture. But this is a weapon that he's coming onto the scene with, and it's not even used by the rider on the red horse who has a great sword. This bow is very, very important. It's a tactical weapon. And particularly once you start looking at the Parthian shot, the Parthians who were the formidable foes of the Romans, who were well known by the seven churches of Revelation, they knew that the riders on the white horse, the Parthians who were associated with the sacred white horses, were able to shoot backwards and move forwards at the same time. They were able to use a bow very distinctly to their strategic advantage. And that's what is being portrayed in the first seal. Someone is arriving and they have a strategic wonder weapon. A wonder weapon that enables him to go out conquering and to conquer. And the whole world says, who can make war with a beast? He has a weapon that we can't, we can't do anything about that. Because he has a very specific tactical weapon. And it's held in his hand. It's in the power of his hand. And we've looked at before how even on the celestial clock when Jupiter was in Sagittarius, right at the star that signals the hand that's releasing the bow, that is when the enemy started putting out the peace and safety warnings, the very warnings that we are looking at now that has brought us to this peak time of summer, too. The enemy is fully aware of the celestial clock. Never, never underestimate that. They fully know what the celestial time is and the prophetic time. And so what we're going to look at today, just an overview from what we know from Scripture. Right now, we are in the days of Noah and Lot. Life is going on like normal. People are still eating and drinking. People are still buying and selling. People are still getting married. People are still planting, planting next year's crops, planting even the winter crops. People are still building or still renovating. Life is still going on like normal. The COVID nonsense has brought different frustrations, but it hasn't stopped life from going on like normal, particularly those tasks. It slowed down or delayed certain planning, but people are still going forward in those. You look at the picture galleries on international newspapers, and that really helps you give an idea of just looking around. And people are still going through these activities. Life is still going on like normal. There's a lot of frustration right now, but those events are still going on. Life is still going on like normal. 
This is where we are. But we are also at a prophetic time where we have heard the peace and safety warnings. We see the very bright pictures in the morning with the bright and morning star rising. We see the coming quickly reminders which is repeatedly emphasized in the book of Revelation. We see the same emphasis and reminder on the celestial clock about the king, the lion, the royalty reminders. Which is also through the book of Revelation. And then the last chapter. And then we also see in that last chapter the emphasis on the water bearer. The one who bears forth and shares the living water. We see that right now on the celestial clock with Jupiter right at Aquarius who's pouring the living water into the mouth of the fish from a hall right under his feet there and we're at the peak of summer so many things prophetically that we see on the celestial clock and that ties exactly to the book of Revelation too so there's so many things that causes us to look up with great expectation at this time we do not know the day or hour but we do know we are very close and we are right over the target of the expectation for his arrival but it also means it's the expected time for the arrival of the snare that is coming upon the whole world too. The very next event that is expected is the rapture. It is the sparing of the faithful righteous. It is the escape from the snare that is coming. It is the escape from all the things that are coming. Not just half of them. All of them. It is the escape from all the coming plagues that are described in Revelation that are coming. Jesus Christ warned multiple times that there is an escape for those who are listening and obeying. But he also warned if you're not listening and obeying. Then you will not escape. And you will be left behind with all the coming plagues. You will be left in the snare. You will not escape. So the very next prophetic event that we are expecting. Is the escape from the snare that is about to spring. If you never put your foot in the snare. You are not caught by the snare. You escape it by not stepping into it in the first place. The escape will come right before the snare springs though. Which also tells us that the very next event is the snare springing. And just like a mouse trap that we're familiar with, it's going to spring suddenly. There are going to be prophetic events that are going to snap instantaneously with almost really no duration of time right after the rapture. It's going to go immediately snapping right into the loop. And when we look in the book of Revelation, the very, very, very first seal, the very first thing that is coming of all the plagues that are coming, what is the very first one? It is the Antichrist rider on the white horse. And he's carrying a time weapon in his hand. He's carrying the snare. This is the very first seal. The plagues and things start coming right away. And this is the very first one. The sudden destruction that is coming. He comes onto the scene already with the bow in his hand. And... When we look at just what scripture says and summarizes about all this, we can see how, yes, the snare will be sprung right away. And the time events, the time changes will happen immediately after the rapture. And there is so much that tells us that the enemy is fully aware that this is a sequence of events and they are expecting the snare to be sprung. The time events, when their Antichrist beast figure arrives onto the scene with his wonder weapon. And just recently was the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And this obviously is a conundrum because it was celebrated in 2021. This was the first time this has ever been done for the Olympics. Delaying them by one year. But then they also made the decision not to change the name from Tokyo 2020 to 2021. They kept the same name from last year. But celebrated it in this year, 2021. A delay of time. Looking backwards in time too. And this is very significant because this has never been done in the Olympics history. Looking backwards from the present. And there's a lot that could be talked about with the opening and closing ceremonies. But some things definitely caught our attention how there is an emphasis on time. Not only the whole package deal being delayed by one year and looking backwards as well. But this was worked into the very introduction of the opening ceremony. As it started, there was a video sequence with 2021, the calendar year. But then they zoomed backwards in time. Yes, at the very beginning of the Olympics, they zoomed backwards in time, going back through the years, stopping at the calendar year of 2013. So at the very beginning of these 2020 Olympics, being commemorated in 2021, but looking back at 2020, they start by taking the whole audience back in time to 2013. And then they show a montage, particularly emphasizing apparently how the location of Tokyo was chosen in 2013. And that's why they stopped there. But again, they start by taking the audience back in time. 
and already they're delaying offset by one year going forward looking backwards one year so for me when i see this time going backwards when they stop at 2013 i'm automatically taking it one year further 2012. they've already taken the audience back in time but the whole olympics are already delayed one year you need to go back one more year to 2012. there seems to be that almost stating 2012 but coming as close as they can say it without saying it but when you understand the delay and then looking back there is a reason they're emphasizing the calendar years and taking you back through them right at the beginning of the olympics when they show a montage of events leading up to 2020 emphasizing and pausing right at times square in new york city in 2020 times square and then they show the power going out, like a stopping there in 2020. And a deserted, empty 2020 Times Square. Very, very interesting that this is how the 2020 Olympics start. Emphasis on going back in time. Time. Times Square. Everything that they are portraying with these Olympics and these occult ceremonies, it's about time. The enemy knows it's about time. Time will be changed. Time will go backwards. They show some of the events after that, but then they come to the athletes looking at this barrier wall. There is a wall in front of them. They're in the darkness, but there is a wall in front of them. And they start a visual countdown from 21, counting down backwards again. And all during this time, the athletes are hammering away at this barrier wall that's in front of them. And eventually that wall, which appears to be as a dimensional wall, breaks down as they keep counting down and keep going backwards. And eventually they are able to go from this place of darkness into the next area. They are making a very powerful statement about time right at the beginning of the Olympics and broadcasting this across the world. That they know there is a time delay but there's also going to be going backwards in time and breaking through the barrier and also breaking open the bottomless pit. Of course the highlight of the opening ceremony is always the lighting of the cauldron which they had a pyramidal shape emphasizing or supposedly portraying Mount Fuji with the sun, Japan the land of the rising sun there. But it also harkens to the symbol that's on the back of the dollar bill, the unfinished pyramid as well. And then they lit the flame, this ball of fire, which symbolizes the sun at the top of Mount Fuji there. And with the coloring, they made it very clear that yes, they are showing a symbol of the sun. But in the closing ceremony, a number of days later, they used a smaller pyramid. But the same coloring reminding the audience that yes, this flaming ball is the sun, but during the closing ceremony when they extinguished it, they then made it clear that this is now the moon. They were emphasizing the sun and the moon. And if you were a little slow and didn't quite get it, they were also emphasizing it on the screen with a space portrayal of the sun and the earth as well. Emphasizing that they're talking about celestial symbolism going on here. The sun and the moon. And even news channels that had live coverage of the closing ceremony, even they came to the quick conclusion, yes, they are acting out the sun and the moon by having these two comparisons here. The Olympic cauldron, which so far has represented the sun, is now cast as the moon. Its metallic casing shifts shape and extinguishes the flame, and then all is dark. So even the world, and maybe they're even deliberately telling you on purpose, they know it represents the sun and the moon, the understanding of the celestial. We can also see it from a biblical perspective too. They have the opening light ceremony portraying a greater light with the flame, which is the sun. And in the closing ceremony, they have the lesser light with the cool light, the moon. The enemy is fully aware of the celestial time. What's going on on the celestial clock? And so while the Tokyo Olympics may not have seemed as extravagant, and there's a lot of events that cause scandal and other talk in the news with the Tokyo events, and then how there's practically no audience, everybody was kept out, there's a lot of distraction with the 2020. But when we look at what is the core messaging that they're pushing, there is an understanding of the celestial time, but then they also fully know that they are delayed in time right now, but there's about to be a backward movement in time toward 2012. A delay offset of one year. And it is all about time. Time across the world too. They chose Times Square which is in New York City. They didn't choose the clock tower in Tokyo. They chose the clock tower in Times Square. The crossroads of the world because they know the events that are coming are going to affect and trap those on the face of the whole earth. 
And at the same time, there is going to be a breakdown of a dimensional barrier from the bottomless pit. There will be a going back in time. And they seem to come as close as they could say that it all relates to 2012. Going back to 2012. And what happened in 2012? That was the London 2012 Olympics. And anybody who has looked at that event, the opening ceremonies or the closing ceremonies or even the stadium itself, says this is a very dark event that's going on here. There's a lot of occult themes that are going on here. Especially the more you study it, you start realizing they are having a satanic celebration in 2012. And when you look at the Olympics that came after this, Summer and the Winter Olympics and the Paralympics, you start looking at the ceremonies, you start to realize that yes, they had different occult themes in their separate ceremonies, but in 2012, they really went all out as a satanic ceremony. There was something very important about 2012 that they were commemorating on a satanic scale. And with the stadium, they had the pyramidal light structures going all the way around it. Very reminiscent of what's on the back of the U.S. dollar bill with the unfinished pyramid and the eye on top of the pyramid. And then they had a torch right next to it. Very reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty torch, which is really the goddess Isis. Everything about the London 2012 was done deliberately for an occult reason. And they had very thin excuses veiling over it, but even the common person said something is really off here. This is, this is really dark, what you all are doing here. And we don't have time to cover all the events of the ceremonies, but we are going to look at what is the theme. In the Tokyo 2020, they were looking backwards one year with the emphasis on time, going backwards in time, pointing to this time. So if we deduce that they are pointing back to this time, then there should be elements in this whole ceremony, this whole event. It should be saturated with elements of time, occult understanding of time, if they truly were pointing back from where we are today. And again, it doesn't take long to find out very quickly that the London 2012 events were very occult in nature. And one thing that helps you understand this is Shakespeare's play called The Tempest. The rest of the story is set on a remote island where the sorcerer Prospero, a complex and contradictory character, lives with his daughter Miranda and his two servants, Caliban, a savage monster figure, and Ariel, an airy spirit. This is very important because this theme is woven throughout the 2012 Olympics. But take note about Caliban. He is a central figure theme that's going to be emphasized through the Olympics. Caliban is a savage monster. He is a man beast. He is the beast. He's not fully human. He's not fully animal. He is a man beast. He is the beast. And you're going to see this theme throughout the 2012 Olympics about the beast coming onto the scene through time. Caliban is half human, half monster. In some traditions, he is depicted as a wild man or a deformed man or a beast man. And those are the common depictions of him. So Caliban is the beast. Take note of that portrayal, that pattern that is going to be used. We're going to see. And he is most associated with a particular quote from The Tempest about the isle is full of noises and I came to dream again. There's a particular section that is associated with Caliban, the beast. But even on Wikipedia, it'll tell you the 2012 Summer Olympics opening ceremony directed by Danny Boyle, titled Isles of Wonder, a name inspired by The Tempest, was heavily influenced by The Tempest. The musical piece played during the torch lighting ceremony was entitled Caliban's Dream. The 2012 Summer Olympics closing ceremony also featured a recitation of the same monologue, this time by Timothy Spall playing Winston Churchill. So they will plainly tell you, yes, the 2012 Summer Olympics was heavily influenced by this particular play by William Shakespeare, The Tempest, featuring primarily the beast, Caliban. So keep this in mind. This is the admitted theme of the ceremony. Which means even though they may not state it openly during the ceremony, you will see that yes, it is the theme that they are emphasizing the beast coming onto the scene. In the opening ceremony, one of the very first segments was called the Green and Pleasant Land. And there were some events and singing right before this, but this was the formal opening when Brunel delivered Caliban's Be Not Afraid speech, reflecting Boyle's introduction to the ceremony in the program. So right here, the first real spoken introduction to the opening ceremony, they delivered Caliban's Be Not Afraid speech, the speech that Caliban, the beast, was most associated with. They just quoted the speech and the audience would automatically know, oh, that is by Caliban, the beast. 
but take note what segment immediately followed them reciting what the beast said. It is the segment called Pandemonium. Pandemonium, which literally means the abode of the demons. Pan, demon, onium. Pandemonium, the abode of the demons. The abode of all the demons, really. That is the very next segment after they have the beast with a speaking role introducing the opening ceremony. Pandemonium. And then right away in that segment, they have the three-ton oak tree on top of the Glastonbury Tor lifted, and industrial workers emerge from both the Tor's brightly lit interior and the entrances to the stadium. If you remember the ceremony, and you can find links to the ceremony, the 2012 and 2021, in the description box as well. But if you watch the ceremony, that is the moment when the tree lifted and all these people came from the underground, right after the speech by the beast, starting the introduction of the opening ceremony. He goes immediately into pandemonium and demons, figuratively, coming from the underground, coming from the bottomless pit. They do their thing in that segment, but it is immediately followed up by a very other important reenactment. They showed a video segment of the Queen of England, the real one, playing herself alongside James Bond figure. They walked through Buckingham Palace and they got in a helicopter, flew to the stadium, and then it appeared that the Queen and James Bond parachuted out a helicopter to the stadium. Very symbolic of the Queen, the female figure, falling from the heavens alongside James Bond as well. This is also important because in October of 2012 was going to be the release of the James Bond film Skyfall. It had already been promoted, it was only a few weeks away. So at the London 2012 Olympics, they already knew about Skyfall associated with this James Bond figure. A movie that relates to Cernernos, CERN. And here at the Olympics, they acted out and reminded people, right after the pandemonium theme, the Queen falling, a Skyfall scene. Which everybody who was familiar with the movies coming out then, with this famous British actor and portrayal, they knew what was being acted out was a skyfall in reference to CERN, right in the context of pandemonium in the Beast speech. But already you can see a very strong theme that is barely, barely under the surface. A very strong occult theme about the Beast and coming from the underground and breaking through the bottomless pit. The demons being released, a time of pandemonium, a skyfall from the heavenlies. And then what segment does it immediately go into? It goes right into second to the right and straight on till morning. The segment about Peter Pan. It is originally written as second to the right and straight on till morning, but you are familiar with it as second star to the right and straight on till morning. And that's how they start out the segment, looking straight at the book, which was written right up the road from Big Ben right there in London. That's why it was emphasized during this London 2012 Olympics. Peter Pan, second to the right and straight on till morning. They're talking about a very specific celestial meaning tied right in context of pandemonium, the bottomless pit, skyfall, and the beast. What follows all that is very important to what they just showed you. And this is a segment where they had all the little children come out on the beds and they were emphasizing the national health system. So they all came out, but then they brought attention to a girl reading the book of Peter Pan. Opening it right up, showing Peter Pan and Hook right here during the segment devoted to Peter Pan. And then they drew everyone's attention to Rawling, who wrote Harry Potter. She read the opening to Peter Pan. So again, keep in mind that they are connecting certain dots here for those who are paying attention to the occult underlying themes, which are not that far below the surface. There's very strong occult themes here, but it goes deeper than what's even on a surface level. Yes, they have Harry Potter author right there, but they're pointing beyond even that. They're pointing to Peter Pan and time, the beast. And right after that wicked author read the opening to Peter Pan, that's when the nightmares came out and they started terrorizing the children going around. And even the world recognized that this is a really messed up ceremony going on right now here. Something is very, very wrong. But then they had about four different main evil figures come out and one of them was Hook from Peter Pan, emphasizing the Peter Pan role through all of this. And they had different characters flying, some of the nightmares, but then one of the main kids was also flying in her bed too as well. Harkens to the Peter Pan. A very occult and dark segment that's specifically named about the Peter Pan reference. Second star to the right and straight on till morning. 
Now, what is that star that they are referring to? If you've seen the Disney movie Peter Pan, they don't specifically tell you and they leave it ambiguous, really. You won't be able to find that star on the celestial map. They're referring to something symbolic. But in the movie, as they get closer and closer to that second star on the right, you really get an idea of what star they really are talking about. You start to see the rings emerge around the star. They're not talking necessarily about a fixed star. They're talking about a roving star, Saturn. And this is driven home even more when you start looking up Saturn. One of Saturn's moons is even named Pan. Pan is the innermost named moon of Saturn, and it works in a shepherding role. Now, NASA and the astronomical agencies of the world, they are very occult. And when you look at the mythological background of Pan, you find out why they named this particular apparent moon about a shepherd, because Pan in mythology had a shepherding role. And the cult definitely knows that Pan and Saturn, Kronos time, are connected. Very well connected. And they act this out in the occult Disney show, Peter Pan. They try to keep it vague for the audience of what star they're referring to. But as you zoom in on it and they draw closer and closer, the audience quickly figures out that they're talking about Saturn. They're talking about Saturn, a place over the rainbow. A place in dimensional time. That's what they're talking about. Neverland equals Saturn. It's Pan's home. A place out of time. That's why it's called Never land. And so definitely keep this emphasis in mind with the 2012 Olympics. They've emphasized the beast coming onto the scene, pandemonium, the demons coming from the bottomless pit, skyfall, Cernernos, and they immediately follow that up with second star to the right and straight on until morning. They know exactly what they're talking about. They are portraying and acting out the arrival of the rider on the white horse, the cracking open of the bottomless pit, and the time snare being engaged. Indeed, as you watch Disney's Peter Pan, you quickly note that they like to emphasize Big Ben and clocks and time. Clocks with the crocodile. Clocks with Big Ben. The concept of out of time with Neverland. Particularly Big Ben. And they bring up this concept of Big Ben, the clock tower, as they are flying toward the second star to the right. So Big Ben is connected with the symbolism of Saturn, Kronos, time. They're tying all these two together. The Pan figure is associated with time. And to make it a little clearer, it is the Pan figure who adjusts time on the Big Ben clock. He adjusts it from 8.03 to 8.15. The Pan figure, the Saturn figure, can change time. That is what they're showing. And so it should not surprise us in the London 2012 closing ceremony that they have Big Ben emphasized again, but they bring attention to it with a particular individual who pops out of the top of the Big Ben Tower. And this also serves as the introduction to the closing ceremony. And what was the formal introduction of the opening ceremony? It is Caliban's quote from The Tempest. And this is what is also quoted here at the opening of the closing ceremony. This Winston Churchill figure comes out of time comes out of the clock and quotes Caliban the Beast. He is acting out the Peter Pan figure type of the Beast, the rider on the white horse, the one who has the time weapon in his hand. At the same time, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, played by the actor Timothy Spall, appeared at the top of Big Ben and reprised Caliban's Be Not Afraid speech from The Tempest, first read by Victorian icon Brunel in the opening ceremony. More paper-covered motor vehicles entered. After Churchill finished his speech, people dressed in newspaper print began to fill the arena, ranging from office workers to school children. The beat of the music got faster and noisier, symbolizing the London rush hour. As the noise reached a crescendo, Churchill cried out for all to stop, bringing the section to an end. So this actor portraying a leader pops out of the top of Big Ben clock and quotes Caliban emphasizing the connection between the beast and a leader, and also bringing things full circle because this is the same thing how things started at the beginning of the ceremonies and the events there as well. So there's a repetition, a cycling going on here. And then they show daily life in London getting busier and busier and actually getting more chaotic, a pandemonium building. When you watch the video, you'll see that. A pandemonium building repeating the same theme that happened in the opening ceremony, pandemonium followed his opening quote. 
But then this Churchill Beast figure cries for all to stop. This one standing in the clock calls for things to stop. And so as the Beast introduces the segment, you see life going on like normal, but quickly reaching a pandemonium. The music is getting very chaotic and discordant. And that's when this individual in time in the clock tower calls for all to stop. And there is so much in this scene. There is so much in this scene. They are definitely emphasizing that this is the beast. This is the Antichrist. This is the rider on the white horse with his bow, his wonder weapon of time. They definitely know what they are talking about. And praise the Lord, he really gave a lot of wisdom about this whole segment, really showing how, yes, the enemy does know a snare is going to be sprung, and that snare is a time loop. It is a time trap. When you start looking and digging more into this scene that they're acting out here, some very obvious red flags start coming up real quickly. When I looked at the construction of this clock tower, and I was looking at the blueprints of it, the Lord brought my attention to who is the company that made this clock tower. You can see their logo right here on their blueprints. It was built by Total Fabrications. And what is that icon in their logo? It was built by Total Solutions Group, whose main logo is Saturn. Time. That is their main logo. They are the ones who built the Big Ben structure for the London Olympics. And apparently their division Total Fabrications, which also has a Saturn logo, is the one who actually made the truss work for it. Now London is a very occult and Masonic city. So there's a lot of venues in and throughout the city and businesses that are intertwined with the activity that's going on there. And so I'm, I was surprised, but at the same time not surprised that they deliberately chose this company to make the Big Ben Clock Tower. A company whose icon logo is Saturn. Time. They made the clock. Now when you watch the Olympic coverage, and particularly of this segment, they apparently only zoomed in enough on those two sides to really focus on what's on those two sides there. But quickly you start to see the writing is from one piece of literature called Kubla Khan. Kubla Khan, or A Vision in a Dream, written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The poem was composed one night after he experienced an opium-influenced dream. And to understand what the enemy is messaging, you have to usually take one step beyond what is the obvious that they are showing. And so they are showing and quoting from Kubla Khan. What is Khan? What is the history of the Khan there? Why was it written? It was reference to a ruler that Coleridge was familiar with. And it's also important to look at literary scholars because usually these poems they have a lot of deep meaning and themes. And so you have to understand what is the, even the secular view of how do they see the themes that are talked about. It's not just a straightforward and simple poem. There's a lot of themes there. And particularly when we see that it was given in a dream influenced by opium. So this is not a normal poem. And so for this particular influenced dream to be quoted on the clock tower, we suspect that there's a lot more involved here. And so we start looking at what do the literary experts say this poem really seems to be talking about. And when you start looking at what poetry experts say about it, they talk about how the Tartars were ruled by Kublai Khan and they were seen and portrayed in the tradition college worked from. The description and tradition provided a contrast between the demonic and genius within the poem. And Khan is a ruler who is unable to recreate Eden. Although the Tatars are barbarians from China, they are connected to ideas within the Judeo-Christian tradition, including the idea of original sin and Eden. You could also say that Kubla Khan is a play on words of Caliban as well. The river Alf replaces the one from Eden that granted immortality, and he apparently attributes the violent children of Ham becoming the Tatars, and that Tartarus, derived from the location, became a synonym for hell. There are more connections to Paradise Lost, including how Milton associates the Tatar ruler to the post-Edenic world in Adam's version of the Tatar kingdom. References to the concept of a lost Eden. And again, this is what literary experts read into the poem, and just connections with other poetic writers in the area and time as well. These are the themes that are being referenced by his poem, Kubla Khan. And since this is a dream-induced poem and is being connected with the beast coming out of time in the bottomless pit, when we start to see the themes that even the secular literary scholars say are in this poem about Tartarus, which is where the fallen angels are bound, hell, and trying to recreate Eden, there's a lot of suspicious tie in that they're actually telling you on the clock who this beast figure is, this guy coming up out of time. They're telling you who it is. It is literally referencing and symbolizing and acting out a breaking open of the bottomless pit, Tartarus, where the fallen angels are imprisoned. They did not quote this poem on that clock by accident. 
They put it there on purpose. And although you can recognize what poem is referenced, you can even see the very portion that is quoted there is talking about the deep chasm that is going through this land. But then also that this woman pines for her demon lover. And there's this deep chasm here. And of course, when you know the greater themes of the poem, it is all about Tartarus, hell, that deep chasm, the demonic contrast, recreating Eden. There's so many. It's very deep what they are pulling together here. And then when you see the structures, clock and time opening, stop. Portraying Tartarus, the bottomless pit, being cracked open with the time key. And fully emphasizing that, yes, even this whole clock tower is built in connection with Saturn, Kronos, and time. And right on the other side, they're showing a weather forecast. They seem to be tying the two together that, yes, they know what is coming up prophetically and what is on the schedule. It is the breaking open of this deep chasm for the fallen angels. But time is going to be stopped. The normal flow, it's going to be changed. The pan figure will change time. And all this is in the closing ceremony. So they finally come down to the end where they're going to extinguish the flame. And there's a segment called Spirit of the Flame. The arms holding the copper petals that formed the Olympic cauldron were part lowered and fireworks set off behind. When the smoke had cleared, a phoenix was seen above the flames. The band Take That then performed the song Rule the World. Darcy Bussell followed, flying down from the top of the stadium in a guise of a phoenix and was joined by four male principal dancers and over 200 ballerinas who proceeded to perform a dance called the Spirit of the Flame, after which the Olympic flame was extinguished. So this is the closing ceremony emphasizing phoenixes and ruling the world. And anyone who watched the closing ceremony definitely recognizes this iconic phoenix that came down and stayed lit during this entire closing segment called Spirit of the Flame. They were making it very clear what is the spirit of the flame here. So after that was lowered, the band Take That came out onto the stage, and there were just four of them, walking around singing the song Rule the World. Now this band actually wrote this song, but they made it specifically for a film. That film was called Stardust, and it was all about magicians and witches. But the whole movie is about a fallen star who turns out to be a woman. The fallen star is a woman. And the song Rule the World was written for this movie about this fallen star. Emphasizing a star so bright you blind me. The woman is the fallen star. She is symbolizing Lucifer. But then they keep emphasizing we can rule the world together. You and me, we can rule the world together. This guy and this fallen star. And so during this segment called Spirit of the Flame, they start out with a song about a female fallen star falling from the heavens and they will rule the world with her talking about lucifer they are telling you exactly what the spirit of the flame is the spirit behind all these ceremonies and all these activities that are going on they're telling you the spirit of it yes it's all about lucifer it's all about lucifer and as they wrapped up their song the lights started going around the stadium of flames flames building a lot of red and yellow lights building but then they had the ballerina come down on a smaller phoenix. This female figure descending from the heavens. And the announcer narrator made it very clear that you understood she is coming from the heavens. The narration is scripted. They know exactly what they are going to say. Very Masonic and occultic. This female phoenix figure coming down from the heavens. And she lands real close to the center of the stage right as these four principal dancers are coming up from a pit. The floor is rising and they are coming up from the pit right at the same time that this female phoenix figure is landing coming down from the heavens. The bottomless pit is opened and the demons are coming out. That's what they're portraying. The bottomless pit being cracked open and they dance together. They dance together. They're reunited. The demons are out as well there. The ballerinas dancing all over the place. A very, a very disturbing theme once you start focusing on the symbolism. And they also have a lot of red lights and sirens going off. A warning. I mean, it literally sounds like sirens going off with the music that they're playing right there. There's a warning, the audience, that this is coming. The bottomless pit and the demons coming out. It's coming. They know it. That is the spirit of the flame that they're reenacting with all these events and the Olympics because they know this is coming. That's what they're celebrating. It's a celebration, a satanic celebration. And it definitely caught my attention with all these dancers doing their routine. The camera brought brief focus to an archer, someone carrying a bow. 
And you don't see this a lot because normally there's a lot of activity in other sets right here on this stage too as well. So this was the first time that I saw it and they really brought attention and parked there for a moment. Right here shortly after the bottomless pit had been opened and the demons came up out of it. They show a figure holding a bow. Holding a bow. The enemy knows who the rider on the white horse is and they also know what the bow is. They know it's a wonder weapon to control time. So they finish up the routine and bring it all to a wrap right with the main principal phoenix figure and the fallen angels all focusing on the flame and the main phoenix. They bring the audience's focus to the flames and the phoenix and then the flame is eventually extinguished. But take note that the phoenix stays lit because that's how a phoenix works. A phoenix will rise up out of the flames being reborn. That's what they're acting out even though everyone thinks oh well the Olympics are over now. This point after the flames are extinguished is very important because the occult believes Lucifer is going to rise up out of the ashes. The conclusion is actually after the flames have gone out. They're showing and seeing him as being victorious. That's the spirit of the flame. Lucifer being reborn. And take a while guess what company also made this phoenix as well. Total fabrications. So as a quick summary for the closing ceremony, they show life going on like normal. Then Saturn Kronos emerges out of the clock. Time opens. The beast emerges. Tartarus, the bombless pit opens. There is chaos and cacophony when the pandemonium, the abode of all the demons segment starts. Chaos ensues. The time clock is stopped with the beast from the event beginning. And this is very important because he's quoting what was quoted at the opening. The same individual now at the end calling a stop to it. They're showing a loop cycle, a cyclical action. It's going to start again with the emerging point. And what is repeated? The time of pandemonium. The time of pandemonium is the Neverland where time has no end. So jumping to the Spirit of the Flame ending segment, they have the flames open, the phoenix lit up, the band sings Rule the World from Stardust, written about a female fallen star person who is Lucifer. Miss Phoenix descends from the heavens, greeted by fallen angels rising from the pit. There's alarms, the beast archer arriving, many demons fallen angels, the flames are extinguished, people stare at the reborn Phoenix. That's what they're acting out in the 2012 Olympics. That was the main focus of all the ceremonies. That was truly the spirit of all the ceremonies of the London 12 Olympics. The beast coming onto the scene, cracking open the bottomless pit, fallen angels and demons coming out. That is the main theme. That is the spirit of the whole thing. And that is what is looked back to from the Tokyo 2020 Olympics celebrated in 2021. Going backwards in time and cracking through the dimensional barrier. And with all the celebrations there in 2012 and their forecast, apparently they seem to know that it is going to take place in 2012. And that is why they are celebrating it then and also looking back toward it in 2021. Now when we start to pull our notes together and just get an idea, again we're speculating. There are a lot of details we don't know, but there's certain themes that we can see are very, very strong that build on what we already know from Scripture. So now we're at a point where we do have to speculate, tied with our educated guess, but also using the keys and anchors from Scripture to help guide our speculation. And so that's what we're doing here. We're going to speculate about what particular window do they seem to be pointing to and how does that line up with what Scripture may be pointing to as well. Because Scripture definitely draws attention to the celestial clock for a reason. There's a lot of calendar things you can't point to. If you know time is going to be changed prophetically, then there are certain time markers that you can't point to. You can't say that's going to happen on such and such time because the time changes will pass over it probably multiple times too. And that's one thing we've pointed out even from 2015 and 2016 of understanding, yes, there's going to be some major monkey wrenches of the Antichrist changing time. And we know Christ is going to change time, shortening the days as well. There's going to be two major monkey wrenches during the tribulation time. So that does affect how you can't, don't try to calculate it just based on linear time. Understand there's going to be two monkey wrenches that are going to come into play before everything concludes at a time that we expect it at. So based on our study and how the Lord has given us wisdom over this learning journey, this incredible learning journey that he has had us on from even 2012 for me personally. And then we started our YouTube channel in 2015. 
it's been an incredible learning journey. And again, as I reflect just how the Lord brought my attention to time back on the literal last day of the London Olympics in 2012, there's been a very specific task that he has shown us to journal this information, this wisdom, and all this nuggets that he has shown us. And he's also giving us wisdom to pull it together and to see the bigger picture of what is going on prophetically. That scripture warns us about, but we can now start to see more granular understanding of how that will actually unfold. So we look back at this learning journey of how we looked up, we lifted up our heads, and we took note of the celestial clock. Because Satan can change time, but he will not be able to change the clock. And so that's why scripture, and even Jesus Christ said, pay attention to the clock. There are going to be certain things going on down here, yes, but pay attention to the clock. And that's why the book of Revelation records celestial star dates, because those are going to be important anchors that other events will circulate around. And particularly, we noticed in 2015, the Star of Bethlehem events that hadn't happened in 2,000 years. Even the world was talking about them. Very, very rare. And then, of course, in 2017 with the Revelation 12 sign. Yes, that was the Revelation 12 sign. And again, we were telling people in 2016, in early 2017, we were telling people, yes, that is a celestial event, but there is a monkey wrench because we know the Antichrist will change time. So yes, we will take note of it, but if the rapture doesn't happen before or at it or after it, keep in mind there is a monkey wrench. We know there is a monkey wrench. If you go past the celestial sign, that doesn't discount the sign because we know the monkey wrench is going to drastically change the whole scenario anyway but it will not change the celestial clock. And that is why scripture references those star dates, because those will not change. You then, once you know the star date, you pay attention to the events and how they are described before that and after that. And keep in mind the monkey wrenches that are going to be right in that mess. And then you have an idea of where they're going to circulate around, all within the last generation too. And so when we also look at the celestial clock, we see Jupiter at Aquarius right now, right above Fomalhaut with the southern fish. Reminding us of the last chapter in the book of Revelation, which also describes the Revelation 12 sign too. And then we also consider how the book of Revelation starts by describing Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, and also describes Pleiades, and describes the Revelation 12 sign, and then ends with a focus that strongly reminds us of the Aquarius picture, right in context of the bright and morning star. The book of Revelation has a very strong celestial emphasis. It needs to be paid attention to because it is recorded for a reason. We also noticed that the enemy was fully aware of time as well. We knew back in 2012 that they were making a big emphasis on time. We didn't know the details of it. The Lord has given more wisdom on that. But we knew 2012 was very important. Even the enemy was emphasizing the end of the world in 2012. They had a different idea of that, obviously. But then even beyond that, in 2015, they knew the timing of the celestial clock with Leo the Lion, the Star of Bethlehem events that were going to be happening there. Katy Perry and her Golden Lion emphasis as well. Then, of course, closer to 2017 with Big Ben right by the Revelation 12 sign as well. The enemy has been fully aware of what's going on on the celestial clock this whole time. They know major prophetic events are going to happen and circulate around these particular celestial star dates. They know that. Once the rider on the white horse comes with his bow, with his wonder weapon, the snare is going to go into effect right away. There's going to be a time snap right away. And of course, there's also in this context that we heard the peace and safety warnings that we were told will bring the sudden snapping destruction, the snare that is coming on the world. We've even heard the very warning that it is almost here. So when we've looked at the Revelation 12 sign, and others have obviously done this too as well, even with just a simple understanding and just a straightforward reading of the book of Revelation, you're like, well, that's the midst of the tribulation. 42 months before that, 1,260 days before that, 1,260 days after that. And it's also in the middle of the book too. So there's a lot that just from a straightforward reading, you know, okay, that should be the midst of the tribulation. But we also know that there's two monkey wrenches in there as well. The Antichrist will be changing time. That messes up our whole counting already. Yes, we've looked at the 1,260 days. We've just gotten an idea of where's the neighborhood where that would end up anyway. But this whole time we've known there will be two monkey wrenches. And there's going to be some very perplexing events that even Jesus Christ said have not happened since the beginning of the world. Some off-the-chart things are going to happen and really mess with time during the tribulation. But it will end up on time that the book of Revelation describes. 
And so we take very close attention how Jesus Christ himself described during the midst of the tribulation at the abomination of desolation after the tribulation of those days, just those days at the middle where it's going to be really perplexing and a hard time of extra hard tribulation. Right around that time, Jesus Christ said, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. After the abomination of desolation at the midst of the tribulation, and after Jesus Christ has shortened those days, after he has shortened those days, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So this is very important when scripture tells us right after those events, the world will see this. So that tells you exactly when those will happen. But right before that, he tells you, I'm going to be shortening the days myself. Right before that happens. It's going to be very perplexing, but he does tell us a very important key. The event that will follow those two monkey wrenches will be this. And you will be able to see that on the celestial clock. And you will know what the sign of the Son of Man is as you study Scripture and what it says. You'll be able to recognize it. And so as I've been studying the snare springing and the rider on the white horse who comes on the scene with the bow already in his hand, and that is the very first event that actually happens. So we know the time event, the snare springing, is the very first thing that triggers right after the rapture. There is going to be the time event then, right away. No delay at all. So if that's the very first event, and then there's going to be two monkey wrenches in between that, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. We know the midst of the tribulation is going to be somewhere before the sign of the Son of Man. We know there's going to be 1,260 days of events before this. Just at a base understanding. Because we know time will be shortened. And that's where they are going to be after time has been shortened. So they're going to be somewhere. Then time is going to be backed up to where they will see the sign of the Son of Man. They're going to be before it. That's where they're going to end up at. Jesus Christ is going back up time too. That's what you do when you shorten the days. You cut back what it was. You cut it back. You go backwards. They're going to end up somewhere before the sign of the Son of Man. So that brings up a really important question. What is the sign of the Son of Man? Well, let me answer that with a trick question. When Jesus Christ was born... There was the Star of Bethlehem sign that appeared the day he was born. But then also the fact that he was born of a virgin was also prophesied to be a sign. So which of those two signs that appeared on the day Jesus Christ was born was the sign of the Son of Man? There were two signs that happened on the day he was born. Two of them. And both of them were prophesied. Which one is the sign of the Son of Man? Well, technically, since they're both prophesied, both of them are. This is something I've been thinking and pondering, and I've, I've mentioned it here and there before in our videos, that if they are going to see the sign of the Son of Man, technically, the Star of Bethlehem sign seen in the heavens was seen on the day he was born, and it was prophesied that the scepter star would be seen. It was prophesied that it would be the sign of that particular Son of Man. So we should understand that after Jesus Christ shortens the days and throws in his monkey wrench, the world is going to end up somewhere before the Star of Bethlehem events in 2015. And all during, all during this learning journey, I've constantly reminded people, the events of the Star of Bethlehem signs and the Revelation 12 sign, it's one sign. Because the sign and the progression goes straight from the Star Bethlehem signs and Leo the Lion straight into Virgo, which is right next to it. And that is how the story even in Scripture goes. It's one sign. It is one single sign. Separated out over time because it acts it out. But it is one sign composed of two rare events. It's one sign though. And both of those signs happened on the very day Jesus Christ was born. So I've said before that the world is going to see the sign of the Son of Man again, and the world is probably going to see the Star of Bethlehem again. The very same events that they saw in 2015. And so this brings up an interesting chain of thought of, if they're going to see that shortly after the midst, after the abomination and desolation, and after the shortening of days by Jesus Christ, then that would place a midst of the tribulation somewhere around June 30th, 2015 knowing that there's 1,260 days before that. Although, there, again, there are two monkey wrenches, but they will end up at somewhere right before that. So you would assume that there's three and a half years prior to that that they've also been playing and messing around with too. 
which if you look at time and date calculator from June 30th, 2015, you count back 1,260 days, that brings you to January 17th, 2012. 2012. Very interesting. Does the enemy know that they will be ending up and playing with a period of three and a half years prior to the Star of Bethlehem sign? It does appear so. I've often wondered why does the enemy have so much emphasis on 2012. And yes, they had the end of the world and my encounter and everything. But just from a biblical perspective, we knew they were definitely pointing to that for a reason. But the more that we've studied and looked at the snare and the loop and how certain signs will happen after two monkey wrenches, from a biblical perspective, we can start to see why the enemy is looking at 2012. Because they know they will be playing with time starting somewhere around the beginning of 2012. They know the end of the world will be in 2012. The end of the world as we know it. The days of Noah and Lot coming to an end. The end of life as we know it. They do appear to know and from a biblical perspective we can see why they are highly suggesting that things will hit the fan in the past. They will go back to the future in 2012. And all we can say is it appears to be somewhere around the beginning of 2012. It might even be January 1st, 2012 for all we know. All we know is they're going to be playing around in time. Two major monkey wrenches causing great perplexity. And then they're going to end up at, after the war in heaven, they're going to end up and then they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man. Which does appear to include the Star Bethlehem events that were seen on the day he was born. But obviously we know the Bible tells us that the Revelation 12 sign will also be seen at the midst as well. And then after that celestial marker, the enemy will continue for 42 months. Continue, keep going what they are doing. So this catches my attention, the gap between the two as well. But especially the more that we rehearse what the enemy's been up to and what they're messaging, they seem to know and emphasize that both 2015 and 2017 are very important. And again, there are certain details that we won't know the exact ideas of how it will play out because again there's two monkey wrenches but we have a pretty good idea based on how the enemy seems to know it's going to be over a certain amount of time and we also know that God is going to be shortening the days as well so that brings up a good question of what days is he actually cutting out of this timeline what time period is missing when he cuts out some time some time period is missing you know it's not a linear straight calculation there is a going to be a portion of time that's missing now, I don't know, but we also do know that there is an offset between the first half and the second half. How much? We don't know. But when scripture does tell us that those days will be shortened, what is he shortening? Is he also shortening days that come after that? We don't know. Apparently, they do see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, starting with the Star of Bethlehem signs. Does he also cut out the in-between times? We don't know. There's about 521 days between the Star of Bethlehem signs and the start of the pregnancy cycle with the Revelation 12 sign. And Jesus Christ himself said, if he didn't shorten the days, no flesh would be saved. There's a progression of a certain percentage of casualties that he has to cut back drastically. So apparently the time cutting back is going to be large enough of a portion of time that it saves a good portion of casualties that would have been. You have to cut back a good portion of time to have some a good portion of flesh actually saved and still alive based on the progression of the casualty count. So apparently in the tribulation understanding there is going to be a good chunk of time missing. Missing. I don't know where it is but it is somewhere between the first half and the second half and they will see the sign of the Son of Man. So it might involve cutting out that portion of time. We don't know. We do know the enemy was very busy around the Revelation 12 sign in September 2017. And they were also really pointing to time then as well. So do they have an understanding that there's going to be a gap or jump in time between those portions as well? We don't know. We just know that they do know something about time is going to happen prior to the Revelation 12 sign. Now, of course, again, with the monkey wrenches, they could be hop skipping around who knows where. But we seem to get an idea that it's probably going to be a certain territory prior to the Revelation 12 sign from 2012 to 2017. That's the closest we can get with granular details, apparently. So just at our speculated, educated guess, when the snare is sprung in 2021, they are going to go back to 2012. The beast is going to come out of time already with his bow. That is the very first thing that is triggered when the seals are open. The very first thing. 
they are going to go back in time. The snare. You're not going anywhere once the snare is sprung. You are stuck there in that loop. And the bottomless pit will open and it is definitely going to be a time of pandemonium. All the demons are going to be coming out of the bottomless pit and fallen angels. It is going to be the abode of all the demons. Literally. And apparently they're going to go forward for 42 months, 1,260 days, and keep looping that portion. And it might be looping around the time of the Star Bethlehem signs. They might see that within the loop repeatedly and then see the Revelation 12 sign after the shortening of days. So that way technically they do see both. But apparently they will see definitely at least one of them after the days are shortened and maybe even after that chunk of time is missing. So definitely somewhere around the beginning of 2012 is very suspect as where the snare will take people. And particularly with the ceremonies of the recent Olympics, the delayed Olympics that were looking backwards, also apparently pointing to an Olympics that celebrated, bar none, the opening of the bottomless pit and the beast arriving, that definitely seems to comport with what we suspect just from scripture as well. So apparently they will go for 42 months, the 1,260 days that the two witnesses will give witness and testimony, and apparently the time is going to loop. They will not be able to reach death during that time because death flees. They are at the edge of tomorrow. They are at Neverland. It never comes to an end. The time loop that they are stuck in. Satan and his followers want to create a Neverland so that they will avoid their appointment with judgment. Remember, after the Revelation 12 sign and the war in heaven there, Satan is very angry then because he knows his time is short. He wants to create a Neverland before that where the time to his appointment is stopped. You have stopped time in the sense that you are not getting closer to your appointment. You are staying in a hovering pattern where you are. And you may remember back in 2017, just a few days before the Revelation 12 sign, on August 21st, the exact day as the total solar eclipse over in North America, the eclipse that was happening right at Regulus in Leo the Lion, the very same day was when Big Ben bongs sound for the final time for four years. This is when they were shutting down the Big Ben clock for restoration work. And it was going to be silent until 2021. 2021. And they announced this back in 2017. And again, considering the occult and heavy Masonic influence there in London, this event should have definitely brought to mind what happened at the 2012 Olympics that happened just a few years before this. They definitely know something about time and stopping, and the Revelation 12 sign, Celestial Star Date Time, and 2021 was very important. So Big Ben was silenced in 2017. But then in 2020, obviously the COVID came up and that slowed a lot of things down. So they announced that the Elizabeth Tower conservation is set to complete in 2022. Another delay, delaying their schedule. And they said it's not due to complete until the second quarter of 2022. So quite some time into the future. But that's for all the restoration work. It definitely caught my attention that the clock is mostly restored now. In July 14th, 2021, the countdown to completion, installing the restored clock hands. So in July of 2021 is when they started putting the hands back on the clock. There's a lot that is already done up at the top. There's still going to be work as they progress with the scaffolding downwards. That's how they're doing the restoration, starting from the top, going downwards. So even though they say they're going to finish in 2022, take note where they are now. They are now at the point where they're putting the hands back on the clock because the clock faces are done. So they are now at the point where Big Ben is now a clock again. It's now a clock again. Which should definitely bring to mind what they showed about Peter Pan and Big Ben and the hands on the clock. The hands being moved. They know a pan, Lucifer figure, is going to come in a skyfall from the heavens and turn back the hands of time. Again, there's a lot we don't know about specifics, but the enemy does appear to know that there are going to be important milestones. And there's going to be important time territory that's going to be played and swimmed around in, where they essentially stop the clock and they don't go forward any further. They stay where they are for a while, buying themselves time but that there is important celestial star dates that they are very aware of on the celestial clock. 
It's not till Satan loses the war in heaven and he is cast out that he realizes his time is short and the Antichrist continues for 42 months after that point, which apparently is picking up somewhere around the Revelation 12 sign. And then there will be 1,260 days that Israel is protected in the wilderness, those who actually get up and flee to the wilderness for that particular time after that, which brings us again to 2021, the early part of 2021. So the Lord has certainly shown us so much along this learning journey, having us look up and learn more about the tapestry of redemption, the story that is told and declared by the heavens on the celestial clock. And the more that we've done so, we've seen about the Star of Bethlehem signs, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, we've seen the sign of the Son of Man, we've seen even how that builds the story and the expectation to where we are now. There is so much about the heavenly story and the prophetic time where we are now when we look up because of the learning journey that the Lord has brought us on and he has shown us so much. And right now we are at a very high watch time. We see so many things that call to remembrance what the Lord has shown us on this learning journey with the celestial signs, the prophetic signs, the agricultural signs, the geopolitical signs, peace and safety, warning us about an unexpected end. And all in context of looking up and lifting up our heads, knowing our redemption was drawing nigh and the more that we have looked up, and lifted up our heads. We've seen the tapestry of redemption, the story of our Redeemer that is drawing nigh. And while there is a lot we do not know, and we do not know the day or the hour, we are certainly at a high watch time, the peak of summer that epitomizes the arrival time, the expected arrival time of our Redeemer. And as we reflect on the celestial learning journey that He has brought us on and that He has shown us up in the heavens and in His Word, He has called to mind how in the book of Revelation, there does appear to be a certain sequence, a territory in the heavens that declares this particular story, even covering the expectation, apparently, of 2012. When we look where Jupiter, the king planet, was back at the beginning of January 2012, and even the end of 2011, Jupiter was at Aries, the Lamb, the Ram, which is a poignant picture to start the tapestry of redemption, and I'm also reminded that in the book of Revelation, the very first chapter, Jesus Christ is portrayed as the one who shed his blood on our behalf. And if you continue through there, the book of Revelation also summarizes in so many ways and touches on these exact pictures. How Jesus came to redeem us and restore us to the fellowship from the Garden of Eden time that he created us to take us to our Father's place, and that is the redeemed pictured when the Lion of the tribe of Judah is shown, who is the Lamb who was slain on our behalf? Incredible story, picture portrayed through the heavens. And then Revelation goes into how he will make his enemies his footstool. And eventually one day, the King of Kings will return riding a white horse, wearing many crowns, diadema crowns, which are different than the Antichrist Stephanos crowns. There will be a rider on the white horse. There will also be the throne of God picture there in the heavens as well. The Milky Way, our atonement, our redeemer. And the book of Revelation even ends with the celestial picture, bringing it all together. The picture that is summarized by Aquarius, the water bearer, the one who brings the living water. And we can understand and appreciate the living water the more that we look back on the tapestry of redemption and we see how it started with the lamb who gave himself on our behalf so that we may be able to partake of the living water. When we look up, when we lift up our heads and we compare what Scripture portrays in the book of Revelation, we can easily see a portrayal from 2012 to where we are now, here at the peak summertime of 2021. There is so much that tells us our redemption draweth nigh. The more that we look up, the more that we lift up our heads, and the more that we look in His Word. There is so much that tells us that time is very, very short. The snare is about to spring. The enemy is fully aware of the celestial time and the prophetic time. They know what is coming, they know who is coming, and they know what he will be holding. Now is when we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, we need to be watching, and we need to be ready. We need to be watching ourselves, making sure our heart is ready, not caught up in the cares of this life. We need to be looking upwards, lifting up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh, and then our heart, our hands, and our life should also reflect and look up in loving service for our Lord. Again, definitely take time to review the resources that are listed in the description box, the PDF resources, the posters on rapturelibrary.com, and as well the videos. The Lord has shown us an entire library of information in so many ways, so many nuggets and insights that are now coming together. And the more that we see and reflect on all that He has shown us, the more we should be watching 
expecting and living in light of his return. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and do good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We can see the day approaching and even so much the more see the day approaching the more that we reflect and meditate and chew on what our Lord has shown us on this incredible learning journey. He is showing us the time. This learning journey has been for us first. On this side of the rapture, we are accountable for it. It is a gift, but it is also a privilege that we are accountable for and we are responsible for. Let us live in light that we see the day approaching. Let us go forward, being found girded in his service and with our lights burning. Over all these years, since 2012 especially, we have heard one resounding message. The bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. As we have gone forward looking up and lifting up our heads, the Lord has shown us more insight to his word, to the time, to the prophecies, to even the celestial clock. And the more that we look into his words, the more we can see about the days ahead, what is coming. On the other side of the snare, a snare is coming. We are told to rise up, to trim our lamps, and to go out to meet the bridegroom because a door will be shut. And once that door is shut, it will be too late. Let us strive to be found with our loins girded, with our lights burning, and going out to meet the bridegroom, drawing nigh to him, hearing him, heeding him, loving him, and serving him first and highest above all else, redeeming the time till he comes. Maranatha!